Hello, everyone. Hello, how are you tonight? Thank you for joining us. Welcome to our tonight's webinar, Job Search and Preparation. We are excited to have you join us tonight. Um, please make sure your microphone is muted while you are not speaking. And we will have, as you know, our dedicated Q&A session uh, 10 minutes before ending the presentation. And let me introduce our special guest tonight. Um, tonight is with us Mauricio Joffrey. He is the lead headhunter of Americas and Montreal Associates. He has almost eight years of tech recruitment experience, an impressive track record of delivering of delivering top tier candidates candidates to clients. Thank you, Mauricio, for being here with us tonight. The floor is yours. De nada. Thank you. Gracias. Gracias. Okay, bienvenidos, everybody. I don't know if you can see uh, my slides yet, but uh, as as she mentioned, yes, yes I've, I've been uh, I've been a headhunter now for almost eight years, completely in technology. Uh, I've recruited in different parts of the world, so what you see here today or the presentation that we're going to be showing here today should be applicable um, no matter what market you come from. And obviously today we're focusing on getting into the Canadian uh, Canadian job market. So started my career here, did a bit of recruitment uh, on the other side of the world out in Europe. Obviously, I'm back in, in Toronto, Mississauga specifically now, and I focus quite a bit on uh, like we just we just mentioned both in North and South America. So super excited to go over this with you today. There's so many things that we could talk about when it comes to job search strategy, but no matter which way you turn, typically in today's world still, you're gonna have to present or uh, submit some kind of resume and some kind of cover letter. And uh, that's what we're gonna be really focusing on today. Just making sure that's up to scratch in comparison to where you might be applying, how to sort of triage the potential applications that you might want to look at and consider and obviously focus on the ones that are going to yield sort of the best return. So if at any point, by the way, you can't hear me, just raise your hand or, or yell out and we'll make sure that we can sort that out. So uh, without further ado, we'll move on to the next slide, if that's okay. So we're going to be talking about, uh, quickly back to the agenda, if, if, uh, if that's okay. So just one slide before this, yeah. So what we're going to be talking about today are, are, I would say, about seven things. So we're going to briefly discuss today's labor market and address what many of you are probably seeing. We're going to touch on generative AI a little bit and why it might be important to start to consider uh, this technology when you're in your application process. A little bit on applicant tracking systems for those of you who don't already know what it is. What I mean by a skeleton resume and having one ready to go, why I think it's a good idea, why I do it myself how to make one. Uh, we're going to compare that live to a real job description. Actually, we're going to, for the purpose of today's sort of exercise and workshop, we're going to, we're going to show you what my resume looks like. We're going to compare it to a real job description and almost how I, with my experience, would apply to this job. So we'll show you how to plug in and rewrite your resume as per the job description. And then of course, write a cover letter and you can ask as many questions as you like. But that's really what today is gonna be about. A little bit of theory in the beginning. Now we're gonna get pretty practical with, uh, like I said, if I was applying for this job myself with the experience I have, how would we sort of make this happen? Next slide, please. Okay. So today's labor market, right, is a, is a bit of a funny one. If we talk about Canada specifically, there's a lot of implications uh, that we're going to have to consider. Number one being supply and demand, right? If you look at, for example, the American market, I would say there's probably a lot more jobs in the States than there is compared to Canada, right? There, there's a bigger population. There's more companies who invest in there. It's just like a case example of why you might see big differences between south of the border and where we are today. Um, there's, I would say, a big gap in most industries uh, with like certain skilled workers, especially technology. I mean, that's the, the place that I can speak most confidently to. Um, yet, for a few reasons, there's a huge backlog of people in uh, hiring processes or application processes for a job. And we're talking like hundreds, sometimes even thousands of people applying for one job, people not getting responses. Like, it's, it's a strange time, right? What we're seeing is a lot of a lot of people, whether they're working directly with an agency head on like myself or not, they're, they feel like they're applying to so many 
different jobs and they're not really getting much traction, right? They, they're thinking more from a volume perspective. Like if I get my CV out to as many places as possible, um, I should land something. Today, we're gonna, we're gonna think about it a little bit differently. I'm not saying there's a one size fits all approach to, to this, but I do believe that taking a bit more of a quality focus to this will increase, um, will increase the yield on, on the interviews that you get, which is just a, the beginning of eventually getting an offer. Now, there's something that you wanna watch when you're going through your applications, especially if you look at LinkedIn, because it'll usually show you, but the number of applications per job, certain jobs you're gonna see very quickly, that number rise rapidly. So for someone who's out there looking for a job right now, you're gonna wanna keep that in mind, I would say, when you're trying to look at where you should put your time. I'm not trying to deter you from going for a job that you really want, but if you have a list of jobs that all look relatively good for you, one of them maybe, you know, or, or a few of them have a lot less applicants and the other ones have hundreds and thousands, you only have so much time in a day to actually create a, a legitimate application, as you'll see later in the presentation, for these types of jobs. You just want to be cognizant, cognizant of that and try and prioritize your time in a way that's going to be the most fruitful for you. Uh, talent acquisition and agency recruiters, so that's when it comes to networking, an idea that I think is a really smart thing for anyone to do. Basically, there's a bit of a difference, right? Talent acquisition is typically a recruiter who sits internally at an organization who recruits for that specific company that they work at. An agency recruiter is someone like myself who works for a recruitment firm that has a variety of different clients um, that each may have their own talent acquisition team, but we basically recruit for people for our clients for very specific, uh, specific niche roles. Now, it's good to network with both of these types of recruiters. They, they work in a little bit of a different way, but there's value to both of them. So it's very important that uh, that you do that. So I'm hearing that there's a bit of yeah, echo on my side. Oh, sorry. There is, um, I think okay. every, everyone is mute, but Mauricio, I think there is a little bit of echo. Yeah. Is it any better now? Is it worse? Now, now okay. it's better. Yeah, it's better. Oh, okay, cool. Perfect. We'll keep it like this then. Um, okay, faster than ever was the final point. And, and what I mean by faster than ever is the the job market really is moving faster than ever, right? Uh, I mean, at, at this point, you could see a job that's posted today and taken down tomorrow, right? A job is posted tomorrow, there's a thousand applicants, few hundred applicants by the following day. Things are moving very quickly. So a mix of networking and what we're doing today, um, I think will will help you on that journey. Really quick before we move to the next slide, is there still the echo or am I audible? No, no I echo? Think it's... Oops. No, no echo. Everything sounds no echo. okay. It's it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. So really quick with generative AI. I am by no means an expert with uh, with this technology, but nonetheless, it is something that I think everyone's probably experimented with a little bit in uh, you know, whether it's for fun, whether it's for the job. I mean, it's 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 in our life right now and everyone's using it for different things, right? Now you're gonna see people who've completely used generative AI um to do their daily work, but also, for example, create resumes and cover letters, right? So is it applicable in, in doing that? Of course, absolutely, right? It's That's, you know, the scratching the surface of what this technology can do. That being said, why are we still having this session? Ooh, lost the slides for a minute. No. Yeah, yes. Give us a second. No yeah, we are back. <laughs> no problem. No problem. So if you can just go on, say, ChatGPT as an example and create a resume and cover letter, what's really the point in having this session today, right? Everyone has a different level of experience with this technology, which means, you know, what you put in is, is different than what the other person might put in and get out of it, right? Um, I, at the end of the day, if you're really, really good at it, you might get a better resume than someone who is still kind of learning how it works. So what we're going to do today is just reconstruct the whole logic behind what we're trying to do. And as you get better with technology such as, you know, ChatGPT, if you can incorporate that into what we're trying to get across today and speed up the process or improve it somehow, by all means, you can definitely do that. But like I said, understanding the logic behind what we're trying to do is going to help you eventually get to that point if you have no experience with it, right? 
how can I leverage this to improve my application? In my opinion, so far, a lot of what it can do, I would say, is saving you time for things that are more tedious. However, you're always going to have to, or not always, as of right now, to the extent of my knowledge with this technology, it's still always good um, to review kind of what the output was and still make changes to make things more personal. In my own experience, when making resumes and cover letters using something like ChatGPT or a generative AI tool, the final product is technically what I wanted, but it doesn't have as much personality as I would like to get who I am across and what my skills are in a way that differentiates me from everyone else who might be applying. So in, in short, it gives me a good framework, but there's a lot that I still have to do to tweak it to make sure that it doesn't look maybe repetitive, as I could say. And, and that's really the biggest thing to be mindful of where it can save you a lot of time, but it's not something necessarily, at least to the extent of my knowledge, that can be fully automated to the point where it comes up with this perfect finished product of a resume or a cover letter that speaks to who you are and why you're really, really good for this job without you making necessary tweaks here and there. And those tweaks, how big they are, really depends on your ability individually with tools like ChatGPT. Next slide, please. So an applicant tracking system is, or an ATS is what most recruitment companies and most, you know, HR talent acquisition teams internally at an organization are going to use to track the candidates who are applying for their jobs, who've applied in the past, people that they want to keep in touch with. There's different ways that they're used, right? And different ways that they intake information. Some of them are completely manual. Other ones are very automated where everything that you put in the application process gets fed right into this ATS. And there's many different kinds, right? It's usually some kind of custom built software or some software as a service. So that's effectively what they are. Who uses them are, are most recruiters will be using some kind of ATS, right? And, and why should you be mindful of this type of technology in a position like yours? The bigger the company is, the more systems typically they have in place when it comes to screening candidates. And ATS systems can be wired to automatically reject candidates who give certain answers to questions or have or don't have X amount of experience on a resume, who don't have X amount of keywords on a resume, or with, they're getting better now where it's not just keywords, it's actually within context. They'll be looking for specific things in a resume. So it's important that especially when you're reviewing the job description, you may look at the JD, JD is just short form for job description, and you may think, oh, I'm perfect for this role, and you have a standard resume that you send to all different jobs, no matter what's on that JD specifically. Even though you might be that perfect fit, if you're not tailoring your resume to every job that you apply for or creating a new cover letter for every job that you apply for, in a lot of ways, you could be reducing your chances or potentially even immediately getting yourself rejected because it's not written in the way that the job description would ask. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about in the next uh, few slides. So keep this in mind. That's why you want to take every job that you apply for. I would say with um, you want to give it a little bit more attention than just clicking quick apply with the same old resume that you've been using perhaps for, for years or for that whole, we'll say, job. Uh, job search period that you're probably in right now. Next slide, please. So what I what I like to have ready for myself, because here's the thing, if you don't have a lot of experience, I mean, you can come up with a new resume whenever you need. It's pretty easy. But after you've been in the space for a long time, you've had many jobs, it, it becomes difficult to have to rewrite a resume and remember all the great things that you've done. Um, when it's only when it's time to look for a job. So something that I think is smart to do is to create almost like a skeleton resume at least. If you want to have context in there, you can. I'll tell you what I mean by that in a minute. But a skeleton resume, is, I think, is a great idea because it, it gives you literally a skeleton of all of your experience that you can quickly alter the descriptions behind it and change with integrity, not changing what you've actually done, but speaking to that job description specifically, you probably have run into this where given the role that you had in your past past job, it's possible that you could fit into one, two, maybe three different types of opportunities going forward. You might be interested in all of them and you want to make sure that you're increasing your chances, especially at a time like this, you're able to sort of 
redirect or not redirect, but refocus your experience on those specific areas by having this skeleton format. So what it includes is just all of your experience. So everywhere that you've worked, the dates that you've worked there, um, your education, where you went to school, if you want to put your grades, you can, but the degree that you had, when you went or when you had that degree, certification, same thing, and volunteer experience. Now, just because you have all of this doesn't mean that you're going to be using that entire massive resume for each of your applications. However, you're going to see in an example here why I choose to include certain things, especially in like the volunteer and certification section, and perhaps maybe exclude other things to make sure that we're very focused in the area that I want to be. Uh, right to work and, and uh, contact information is key, especially if you're you know, brand new, you just immigrated to, uh, to a country, you want to make it clear that you have the right to work. If you don't have the right to work and you need some kind of sponsorship, it's always good to be upfront and honest about that because the companies who will have the ability to do it will put that focus on you. Um, like I said, dates, titles, the name of, of where you went to school or where you work, that's key and that's not really going to change no matter how you adapt your resume. So that's something that you can keep, um, you can keep consistent. Now, what I said about the length, don't worry about how long it is, right? Right now, we just want everything in one place, like in a Google Drive or something that you can go to, edit, alter, download a copy and use it to submit and then further change it as you go, okay? Next slide, please. So this is an example of my, we'll say skeleton resume, okay? Obviously it's tough to kind of show you this in a PowerPoint format, but this is effectively the same thing, how it would look, whether it's on a Word document or a PDF, whatever have you, right? At the top, you see a profile section. I've left that bare because my profile line or my headline is something that again, I'm probably gonna change every single time I apply for a job, depending on what that job is all about. After my profile, where I'd have my headline, I'm going to have my experience, right? And in my experience, I have the bare bones of, of what I've done. So Montreal Associates is the company that I work at now, uh, global uh, recruitment firm specifically for the tech industry. I have all the titles that I've held um, at Montreal Associates and, of course, the dates associated to that because that isn't something that is going to change. Tech Systems, again, great company that I worked at previously. Same thing. I've had a couple of positions there. I list what those positions were, and specifically um, the titles or the, the timelines, rather, that I've had. <clears throat> I'm currently in, in, enrolled in uh, the University of Carleton, so I have um, the fact that I'm presently there, uh, completing a degree, and then I have my undergraduate as well listed, same thing, when I completed the degree, the type of degree, all the way down to the major and the minor. Certifications, again, I, I, I do have more than this, but for the sake of space, I condensed it to two, um, or I believe that's actually just one um, from the University of Alberta and, and the date, and then a couple of volunteer um, pieces, things that I do currently uh, and previously as a volunteer that I want to make sure that I have there and I'll show you why in, in just a minute. But again, even if you have more than just a couple of things, you want to have all of it. So you can plug and play with this skeleton resume as you apply for whatever job you decide to, right? This is the stuff on the skeleton resume that won't change. Everything else that's going to be described within those roles, as you'll see later, is what we're going to be uh, altering here. Next slide, please. Perfect. So we're going to talk about job descriptions in a minute. And we're going to get back to the, the resume and see how this all kind of fits together. But whether you use LinkedIn, Indeed, uh, Monster, some people use all of them. Some people only like certain ones, whatever works for you. The key thing is going to be consistency. Even if, uh, even if you have a job and are gainfully employed now, but you're looking, a big thing that I see with a lot of people who are employed is it gets really easy to fall off track when it comes to looking for a new opportunity. So whether you're following up with a recruiter once a week to talk about prospects, whether you're doing this yourself completely and you're checking daily as to what's being posted, you create your LinkedIn alerts so that the right jobs alert you at the right times, your preferences improve as you see more jobs and say, I like this one, I don't like that one. You want to just make sure you're consistent, right? Whether you have a job now or you don't have a job, you don't have a job especially, you want to almost treat this like 
a job, right? You wake up at a certain time, you're going to hit the computer and you're going to start looking at prospects. You're going to be connecting with people. There's a lot that you can do, even if you don't have a job to really move things along. And that's a big part of it. And just blocking time and being consistent with logging on, checking the prospects, connecting with your recruiter uh, network and seeing what's new, really. Uh, utilizing filters and alerts, as I said, it is really key. There are some people, especially when you know, it's been a while that you've had even an interview, you can start to get desperate. It can get really tough. Um, I mean, really tough in a sense on your mind, right? Because if you are under the gun and you're, you're really looking for that opportunity, you've got bills to pay, it can be really tempting, especially I saw someone just comment on the easy apply button to easy apply for as many jobs as possible using the same resume and hope that, you know, the right op comes through. Really consider what your experience, where it's valued, where it would be valued, uh, directly where there are transferable skills and create alerts and filters for that to try and pull up the most relevant opportunities for you. Three really, really good relevant opportunities. You're going to have a better chance at those as opposed to a hundred non-relevant opportunities where you just click and apply. So always start with what's most relevant. You're going to have more energy to apply to more of those relevant roles than just clicking apply to a hundred ones that maybe don't make complete sense, even if it's somewhere you want to get to. So, like I said, just keep that in mind, start with what's most relevant and take it from there. And application target, I think is great as long as you are, you know, focusing on where your strengths are and not just clicking, like I said, but a realistic application target where even if you're saying, I'm going to put everything into an application, I'm going to do two per day. I commit to that and you write two really, really good applications per day. Same thing. I'm a big believer that quality is, is much more valuable than quantity. And I think that's somewhere where you're going to start to get a lot more success than, uh, than like I said, kind of playing the volume game. Uh, if you don't mind clicking to the next slide, I see all the questions coming through and I'll definitely be answering all of them before the end of, uh, before the end of the, the session. I promise. So this is an example of a real job description that I found online that is for a senior IT recruiter for the Italian market. So in Italy, uh, recruiting IT people in the Italian market, okay? Again, I know it's different from where a lot of you may be applying, but for the, the sake of context and using my resume as a, as a case study, we'll say for this session, um, we, I decided to go with this one. And you've seen job descriptions set up like this, right? About the job and they write like a little one-liner right at the top to try and get your attention. Something about you will be all of these things. Uh, you will have X amount of things. And then sometimes they'll have like a little disclaimer at the bottom about uh, potentially, potentially, in this case, it's, it's DE&I, diversity, equity, and inclusion. But there's a lot of things that they could have as, as a disclaimer at the end that you don't want to discount. You want to make sure that you read it. So if you want, maybe take just like 60 seconds and skim through this so you have an idea of what's there before we move to the next slide. If you don't mind, just giving a, a quick minute on this one and then we can move on. Sorry, quickly go go back to the last slide just so people have a chance to, to read, if you don't mind. Thank you. Yeah, forward one, just so it shows the job description. There we go, perfect. Vale, we can move on. Thank you. So what we're literally going to do, right, is take this line by line for everything that we just saw and what they're asking for. Line by line in every single one of my experiences, where can I speak to each of those, right? So if we take that first line, right, whatever it was, I would literally to start, we're not submitting a resume this way. This is just to organize your thoughts. We would take that line that they're asking for and put it into that experience section. So if in my most recent role, I've done that, I'm just going to paste it there. If in my last role, I've done it as well, I'm also going to paste it there. My third role, I've done it here, paste it there. The fourth role, maybe not, I won't put it. The fifth one, if I've done that specific point, I would put it there. Same thing with every single point. And you can see how 
that can take up a little bit of time and not everybody wants to put in that kind of time, but it's much better to organize for exactly what they're asking for in the language that they're asking for. And I mean, language specific words that they're writing their JDs, where in your experience, all the way down to however far you want to go, can I speak in some way to that specific point? And you will do this with every single one of those points until what you're going to have is their words into your resume bucketed into each of your experience, education, volunteer, all of those sections, right? And what you're going to do then is rewrite effectively that point using as much language as you can, but within context for your role. So you want to use their language, but you're not just going to copy their JD and send the CV. That's not going to land, right? Even if you make it past the first stage, they're going to look at that resume and they're going to say, okay, this person clearly just copy and pasted. We should get rid of this immediately, but you can still use their language. You can notice specific words in the, even if it's one or two words that you think are key words, write that in context for your role. So apply it directly to your, to your world, right? The better you can do this, even in the beginning, you may have a ton of points that you may have to cut down, but at least what this gives you is context in this company is looking for these things in a candidate. These are all the places where I have it. Okay, these two roles, it almost looks exactly the same. Maybe in this one, I can focus more on these points. And on the top one, I can focus more on those points. So you're, you got to play with it a little bit to balance it at the end. And this is what I mean by you could use generative AI technically and say, hey, this is my CV as it is now. This is a job description. Can you look at where uh, there's coincidence between two things and put them together? and create me a new resume. You could do that, but at the same time, unless you're really good at prompting and all that kind of thing, it may not be exactly what you're looking for. So learning the logic behind what we're doing and why we do it to not only make it sound and look like very relevant to the JD, but also very personal and look legitimate and look, uh, I don't know how else to say it, but look authentic, we'll say. That's where it takes a lot of practice and, and, and this type of CV writing can help you do that. Next slide, please. So for the profile section, we can look at the old um, job description if you like, but for myself, I pretended I was applying for this job, yeah? Uh, this is what I wrote as my headline, right? Now people sometimes, they write a whole ton of things in their profile, a bunch of bullet points. I've seen people's profile section, one page. Personally, for me, as someone who reviews tons of CVs uh, per week, per month, per year, whatever, this one liner, if written well, is more powerful than a massive one pager of your profile. So I wrote, based on the original JD, a sales driven, dual citizen, Canadian, Italian, this is true, with seven plus years of international agency recruitment experience. And if I were to summarize, what they were asking for, I believe that that touches on everything, right? And what, what this is, the whole point of a good profile one-liner is just enough to get them to want to read the rest of your resume. If this was a whole page, someone might look at it. They may not take the time to review everything. And they may just say, you know what? I'm going to pass on this resume. It's kind of too much to digest, right? You want a lot of information there that speaks to the JD, but you got to take it in, in like bite-sized pieces, right? Um, it's got to be digestible and, and little by little has to make them want to read more. You can't lose the reader. And you have to think about some recruiters that are going to look at this internal or agency are going to be very experienced and they're going to know what they're talking about. But then there's some who are going to be brand new and like anyone who's new at a job, they may not know what to look for. And they may, they may be looking in a, in a bit of a rudimentary ray, which you can't blame them for because they're learning. But all the same, you want to speak to something that is very clear, very concise. And I think anyone who's recruited for this role who sees that might be enticed to, to, how do you say, proceed and read the rest of the profile. Next slide, please. Okay. So now, again, you may not remember what was written in the original uh, JD, but if you happen to remember after reading it, this is how I would then input this information into that portion of my skeleton resume. So you remember what that looked like, right? It was just the title. It said Montreal Associates, June 2019 to present, 
head of sales, talent solutions, Amarlatem, June 2021 to present. That's all it said with the rest of my job positions. Now, what I put or what I decided to put based off of what was in the job description is what you see here, right? So there's a lot of things here that are very specific to my experience, which is good because it shows authenticity that I actually took time to put my experience into the into the job or into my experience section. But if you look at the language, I tried to use as much language as possible that the JD used just in, in my own context, right? So in anywhere, did they say anything about the Americas, about Dreamforce, about Salesforce candidates, for example? No, they didn't. But within the relative context of each of their bullet points, I made it my own by using my own experience the best that I could, right? This keeps it very honest, it's complete integrity in, in what I wrote, but speaks to their job description specifically point by point by point. And like I said, you would do this for every single one of your experience sections that you have. Even if it means one of them, you only have a couple of points, work with what you got, right? At least the points that you have there are gonna speak well to that JD. Next, uh, next slide, please. So for education, right? My, I, I would have written what I could for, for the, the most recent degree that I had, but I wanted to focus on this one because you kind of got to think a little bit outside the box. A lot of people just put um, their degree when they did it and that's all. But when it comes to these types of applications, especially now where it's highly competitive and they're getting flooded with resumes, you want to stand out in as many places as you can, right? So instead of just kicking, clicking quick apply at a job that looks like it's okay. I read through the JD, right? And what are they asking for here exactly? They're asking for an IT recruiter, a salesperson to work the Italian market, right? I'm someone from Canada or who's living in Canada. While I may have an Italian citizenship that makes me eligible to work there, luckily. Do I know that market? Have I shown an ability to adapt to that market? Do I have anything tangible to show that I'm better than? you know, someone else who already lives there for this type of job. I mean, potentially not, potentially yes, but potentially no, right? So something else that I could do is given where I studied and adding some context past, uh, past this, you know, my experience, I did happen to study international business with a minor in Italian studies when I was in, in university. So I majored in international business. I took part in a three week school tour, like a study tour in Southeast Asia. Um, very quick to learn how businesses conduct uh, their operations internationally. Is that going to be a game changer? No, but that in conjunction with my experience could very well have a bit of a pull on, hey, this person has seen a couple of things. You know, they're, they're young. They don't have a lot of experience, but you know what? They've, uh, they've made the effort at least to try and study other cultures. If anyone's going to be someone who can adapt to the way that we do business here, I think it's worth taking a chance on this person. Maybe, right? It's, the, it's all that I got to show. I want to make sure that I show it. My minor in Italian studies, um, and I was a TA, I was an instructional assistant, actually, for the Italian course. No, I'm not fluent in Italian. I'm passable, I'd, I'd like to say. I think I can speak decently enough. But moving to a place where I'm going to have to speak that language, I have to show them in some way, if I can't say I'm flat or fluent, like professionally, this is what I've done to try and learn the language best I can. And it's on my resume, and here's what I have to show for it. Next slide, please. So it's an IT, it's an IT uh, recruitment role, right? Um, and all that I had before was uh, it was a it was a certificate from the University of Alberta. It happened to 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 deal with uh, like in Indigenous Canada, Indigenous Canada, like studies on uh, on Indigenous worldview. Now, for specifically for recruitment, for tech recruitment. I felt what was most relevant or the certifications that I had that were most relevant. I'm not saying I wouldn't list that cert, but two things that I wanted to highlight here were uh, two things that I think speak more directly to that JD. So in the IT world, there's a lot of different areas of technology. Salesforce happens to be one that I'm quite privy to. Now, while I recruit um, those type of IT candidates specifically who are in that Salesforce world, um, I've also done my due diligence in doing some of their certifications myself, one of them myself, just to understand that technology a little bit better. Now, when a recruitment company sees that you have an experienced recruiter who's gone above and beyond to try and learn the technology that this person would work in, hey, that's a pretty relevant certification to put on your resume. And think of things that way 
or maybe there was something you wouldn't include that has nothing to do with recruitment, the direct job that I work at. However, could it show that I've gone above and beyond to try and learn more about the space that I'm jumping into? Absolutely, it could. I encourage you to think the same about some of the extra certs that you've done. And maybe you don't think hold a lot of value in getting a job, but they create a, a brand perception. We'll say the optics around you as a candidate could improve. Um, I did a course in international labor law as an agency recruiter. I mean, it's not incredibly important, but could be interesting for the company in, in Italy, as I showed you, that's looking for a recruiter to work their market, right? Again, just something to differentiate a little bit that looks like it could be in line with the person who would assume that role. Next, please. So volunteer, again, a lot of people leave their volunteer experience out of uh, their resume because they think it's too much. And sometimes it could be too much, right? Depending on what you put. If everything that you put in your experience is geared towards that job, then, I mean, you could have a pretty long resume as long as the person's interested in continuing to read it. That's really what the important part is. It's like when I talked about the profile section, that first one liner is just to get them to keep reading. That's all it is. It's not going to get you the interview right off the bat, but it's going to get them to say, hey, I want to read this person's experience. Oh, I wonder where this person went to school. What else have they done outside of school and work that you see what I mean, where it gets them to keep wanting more until they finish the resume. And the only thing that I can say is when can I interview this person, right? So one of, one of the places that I happen to volunteer, and again, this is all 100% truth, right? In comparison to this JD. Um, there's an organization in Toronto that promotes, um, so Calabria is a, is a region within Italy. It's the region that my my, uh, my dad's family's from, and I'm involved in a non-for-profit as a board member, promoting um, people to rediscover and reconnect with their Calabrese culture. We throw all types of events, supporting different non-for-profit initiatives in, in the Toronto community, and we do what we can. Um, to try and to try and do that again that's something where if i was applying to a job in italy and they see immediately calabria as one of the 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 places you know the, or the comp or non-for-profit rather that deals with this type of culture in my volunteer experience it could be something that catches their eye right and at least gets them to want to read more and that's what we're trying to do here you remember the disclaimer at the end um, that i mentioned about diversity equity and inclusion that's not a requirement in the role. That was just telling the applicant that we abide by these practices. Clearly, this is an organization that takes it seriously. Well, in my last role, actually, I was a volunteer at my own organization to be part of our diversity and inclusion committee, diversity, equity, and inclusion committee to organize trainings and events for our staff um, so that we could abide by those same principles, right? So it was called the Kaleidoscope committee. I was, I was a, a part of it for, for a chunk of time. And that's something where, no, is that going to get me the interview right away? No, but it's something that would speak to the person who wrote that job description and is looking for a candidate who embodies those values. Not something that people would think about right away. Oh, this is something really key that I want to put on my resume. It has nothing to do with IT recruitment, but we're reading deeply the job description. And that's something that speaks to their values. And if all you had are these two pieces of volunteer experience, I think it's a really nice compliment for, uh, you know, the prior work experience and education that I showed you before. Next, please. So with a cover letter, um, a little bit, I, I would say, to be honest, a little bit easier than a resume and 100%, I would say you want to be making a new cover letter for every single job that you apply for, right? The easiest way to start doing this, and I, I've gotten interviews at companies that traditionally, I would say, are, let's say organizations, not really companies, but organizations that are traditionally known to be very difficult to, to get interviews at, and I use this approach. Uh, in, in, in getting it. Everything was, was very honest. Everything, I didn't lie at all. All I did was speak directly to what they asked for in the JD. So what I started with is I started by pasting it, the JD itself, into a Word document and replacing every single line like we did with the resume with a one-liner that is more like holistic. It encompasses all my experience and where can I speak to that. Right now I have my skeleton, we'll say skeleton framework, right? You got to make it flow. So you're going to rewrite it again within context, right? Could you use generative AI to homogenize that cover letter after you've gone through a few revisions for fluidity? 100% you could. Could you paste it? Could you paste your resume in, in uh, ChatGPT, paste the job description and say, hey, can you use my experience to write a decent cover letter? 
right? Uh, for, for, for me, given this job description, absolutely you could. And I'm gonna show you what one looks like right now. Go to the next slide, please. That's exactly what this is, right? I, I obviously altered it. And I mean, when I say altered it, I tried to, Generative AI is only so good for right now. It's going to get a lot better, but it was a bit, I would say, uh, it, it spoke to my experience well, for sure. But there's some like words that I had to change to make it flow a little bit better. But in short, this was technically a cover letter that's written by Generative AI. Personally, I think it's a bit dry, the one that was written. So could, could I have asked it to change the tone and this and that? Absolutely, I could have. But if you look at it and you read it, there's... No, like this is completely honest, right? It's using all the experience that I gave it to create uh, a letter for me. And what, what I mean by using it as a good tool for now, unless you're like killer with comps and you can get it to like mirror your personality and your writing style exactly. Uh, for right now, even just saving some time to get a basis going and then going in paragraph by paragraph and maybe even rewriting it, trying to use the same language because it probably use that from the JD, trying to use the same language, but making it more you, making it speak to your experience a little bit better in some ways than others. But a key thing for cover letters, um, in my own experience, is you want to really speak directly to the JD that is there. Don't deviate, even if you've done all these other great things, right? Really speak to what's there on paper. And that's what, you know, is going to get you through, uh, through that stage. A lot of companies, I'll be honest, don't even ask for cover letters these days, but some of them do, and you want to be ready for it, right? Personally, if you look at like what in in my uh, in my world, I don't look at a cover letter at all. But typically, when it comes to especially applying directly to an organization, again, I'm an agency recruiter. Remember, internal recruiters have, a, have it a bit different. They have an ATS where you may have to, you know, they're the the end clients, so the clients that we would service sometimes have different rules about recruitment where you need to submit X amount of documents just to get through their process, and that's where these cover letters sort of come into play. Next slide, please. Q and A. So I think I've left. Uh, I think we have 15 minutes, which I think is good because I saw a lot of questions come through. Uh, I'd like to answer them all if possible. Yes. Do you, you want to read them out to me and then maybe exactly. I can answer? Exactly. Yes. Yes. I will. Do. Thank right. you. Thank you, Mauricio. Um, very useful information for of of us. Thank and you. yeah, actually, we have some questions. Important question. Um, Beautiful. Actually, we did a poll on LinkedIn about the confidence in writing cover letters. I will mm -hmm. say that 50% of the participants, they feel that they not feel confident about writing the, the cover letters. So I think your tips uh, tonight are very use useful. Um, and uh, regarding the question of the cover letter, if uh, we have a question that is that the recruiters read the cover letter before the the resume or after the resume or what is the what do they read first resume like every company letter. sure yeah sorry i mean to cut you off every company is going to be different right to me i mean it, it makes sense chronologically that you'd read a cover letter before a resume but personally i don't think that's very common most recruiters will probably only look at the resume i'm not i, I don't want to speak for all of them because if they're asking you to submit a cover letter it's for a reason and again, like I said, certain ATSs are, are uh, created in certain ways to sometimes automatically filter candidates depending on what they submit. So in a case like this, even though someone may not read that cover letter, you don't know how well, especially now as AI is starting to improve and being implemented in these types of SaaS products, it could come better and better, not just at identifying keywords. It's already pretty good at identifying context. So as much as it is tedious to write, especially not all, if you're a client or a recruiter directly and they ask for a resume, they're probably not going to ask for a cover letter. That's usually something that's through the ATS. So when it's asked for, you want to be ready to write it. But as an agency recruiter, for example, or if you connect with an internal recruiter directly on LinkedIn, they ask for your resume. Don't necessarily write them a cover letter and send that as well. Wait until it's requested. Then you can write a cover letter specific to the JD. Right? Right. Perfect. Thank you. And we have a question from Jose. Mm -hmm. um, is it a good idea to use the easy apply button on LinkedIn for some jobs? Yeah, 
it's, it's a good idea. It's like I said, you can, just because you use easy apply, I believe you can still interchange what resume that you use, right? It's not uh, you can, you can decide if you want to use the same resume as last time or not. The issue with easy apply is if you use the same resume and easy apply to 300 different jobs, and then you're wondering, oh, why haven't I gotten a bite? Well, I mean, every job description is written differently in a different tone with different words, different companies of different values. You, you, it, you wouldn't do that, right? If you, if you're really going for a role, I know it takes more time, but always think quality over quantity. You want to be thinking every single job that I apply for, unless the words in the JD are verbatim the same, I'm applying with a different uh, resume and it requires a different cover letter. The only thing that you wouldn't change job for job is your LinkedIn profile, because that would be insane. Thank you. <laughs> Keep that consistent, holistic, and, and alter the resume as you go. But yes, in short, yes. use the easy apply. Okay. Um, next question from Antonio. And when is a good idea to get in contact or connect with the recruiter directly if the name is listed in the application? Uh, I mean, it doesn't hurt to connect to them right away. It, it's the messaging and how you follow up that is what could determine whether you get a meeting with them or not. Remember, 300 people apply, 300 people send the same message that probably looks identical. Hi, my name is this. I saw you posted this job. I have XYZ experience, hoping we can meet for whatever period. It's like no differentiation, right? To me, if I was applying, would I reach out to recruiters directly? A hundred percent, I would, but I would probably not be using that type of follow-up. Now, how you craft your outreach to a recruiter is probably a bit outside the scope of, of today's uh, session. We could talk about this for a very long time, but being a bit creative and using, you can, on your phone, if you have LinkedIn, you can actually send a voice note. I don't know if you knew that. That was within one minute, real quick, just to, to let them hear your voice as opposed to writing it. You can send a video, a 30 second video um, to catch their attention, not explaining your experience, but why you were excited to apply and that you look forward for the opportunity to be potentially selected. Could that make them go look at your application and push you through potentially if you're a good fit as opposed to everyone else who wrote the same message? In my opinion, yes. So I'm really, it's not about should I connect with them? It's Yes, connect with them, but what is my approach going to be after that to push this along as opposed to getting me just cut off or not responded to? That's the real, you know, situation you want to find and figure it out. Thanks. Next question from Emmanuel. Uh, what are the uh, maximum or minimum bullet points or achievement that we should list in our LinkedIn or in our resume? And there is a minimum or maximum bullet points? I mean, I, I would say per experience section, like you don't want to write a whole novel, right? If you're at a point where you have that much experience, sometimes creating a, uh, like breaking your individual experience up into projects, right? So especially if people, like, again, I'm a bit biased because I, I work in IT space, but usually within IT, there's different projects that would have been delivered. I, we implemented this system or we, you know, implemented this type of process like you're implementing all these different types of things right creating this interface whatever and if you want to have a bit of a longer project list that speaks to those things with all of those contexts yeah that might be a good idea for a resume i think five six bullet points max is more than enough per experience but um it, it's all about fluidity right and, and eliminating redundancies don't write the same thing one after the other if you can condense it into one point do it right? The more concise and clear you could be, the better. If you could write one sentence that got you an interview, that's the most ideal, but typically that's not the case. You can't do that, right? So being as concise as possible is key. You can keep the five bullet point idea in your mind for your resume and see kind of where that gets you. With LinkedIn, I would say utilize the project section of LinkedIn to really go into detail, but try and create or, or sum up your experience in one paragraph that's really easy to digest. So someone knows exactly what you've done when they read your profile and there's no ambiguity on who you are and what you do, All right? Very clear paragraph. If you want to get into details, utilize the project section of your LinkedIn and break your experience into projects. Thank you. Uh, from Jose, uh, he's asking if um, uh, you recommend to add, do you recommend to add the contact information in the cover letter, like, phone number, email, et cetera, or just attaching the uh, resume? 
I would say for me, uh, yeah, like you with a resume or with a cover letter, you're always going to want your contact information, right? So name, number, and city uh, is more than enough. If you live in a city where, I mean, it could be in multiple countries, maybe put the country as well. I'd refrain from putting like your actual address. There's really no reason to, to do that. You don't need to have all of these people know where you live. So name, uh, how best to contact you, cell phone number, uh, email, and then, like I said, just location city where you're based. And well, that is, uh, this is a, a popular question when uh, they find a job that fits perfectly with their experience, et cetera, but there is more than 100 applicants, but just pass, you, they just have just three hours and that, then it's, then is there is more than 100 applicants is good idea to apply for it. So it's like we said before, right? You want to prioritize because let's say, for example, you don't have a job, right? People talk about burnout in their jobs when they, when they're employed, people burn out when they're applying for jobs too. Right? So you want to be just smart with your time. And if I got five jobs where no one's applied yet, and I have one that looks really good, but there's already a hundred applicants after three hours, if I only have two hours to get my applications done today, and I'm going to take the approach that we just saw, right? Like that where you're rewriting your resume every single time, where would I focus my time, right? When you think about supply and demand, when you look at opportunities where they've been open for a long time, but there haven't been many applicants, I mean, that could be a goldmine for you. If you love that job, regardless if there could be problems within the company or other, you know, cons, we'll say why someone wouldn't want to apply. For you, it could be great. All you concern about in this case is you're fit for that role. That would be like a gold mine. You want to maybe focus your time there first. And if you have time, then get to the one where there's so many applicants. So it really depends on what your pipeline of prospects looks like. If you have nothing else to apply for and this job looks perfect, it's all you got, then you really want to write like a killer application, right? Take the time, do what we said, reach out to the recruiter in a way that's not that standard message. You want to kind of throw everything um, at this to try and increase your chances. It just, I'm not trying to uh, tell you don't apply. I'm just trying to tell you to put your energy where the higher yield is going to be and then work your way down from that. Prioritize your ops and go for them that way. Thank you. And I have two similar questions from Mustafa and Antonio uh, regarding the the recruiters compared the resume with the bullets in LinkedIn or their profile in, in LinkedIn. So should they tailor it according to the profile, to the job description, et cetera? Yeah, great point. So that's why I recommend uh, on your LinkedIn, writing just like a paragraph, not too long, just a paragraph that holistically explains who you are and what you do in that role. Right. So you're not getting into too much detail with bullet points on this and that you're, you're utilizing the, the right keywords within context of your role, but rather explaining why, uh, or not why, but what you do, what, what did you do in this job? Explain it so that anybody can understand at any level, right? This way it shows clearly who you are, what you do in this role, in this role, in that role, utilize the project experience. If you want to get into detail. Okay. The, do they compare? LinkedIn and, uh, and, and resume. Absolutely. If I get a resume that says one thing and I find the person on LinkedIn, it's completely different. You think that person is going to get an interview? Like, absolutely not. Right. No way you, you, with all the other people who are applying, you, you don't want to be doing that. But the whole idea is if you're being honest with the way that you're rewriting the points, according to their JD, compare that to a holistic explanation of who you are and what you've done in each of those roles, it shouldn't be that different. It's just more geared toward specifically what they're asking for. So don't reinvent yourself and write things that aren't true. That's not what I'm saying. It's just within the context of what they're asking, where applicable. If there's three points in that JD that mean nothing to you, do not write those in your JD or in your, in your resume or your cover letter. You can't speak to that, right? Write honestly what you can speak to holistically, in an easy to understand few lines paragraph way on LinkedIn, they should be comparable no matter how you alter the CD within within reason. And thank you. And we have a uh, very important question regarding our experience. Probably as a newcomer in our backcountry, we are in a senior level. Mm. And now we are 
desperate probably or disabled, we need a job and I fit well, but this is an entry level job. This is an entry level position. So, and, but we need to be transparent about our experience, et cetera. So what would be re your recommendation with that? Uh, I mean, it's a tough one. Different markets, like I, I, I've talked to a lot of people recently in this sort of situation, like they've recently moved or looking to move to an organization or, or a new country rather. And depending on the industry that they're in, it could be a lot easier for them. The industry that they're in and the country that they're going to and the value of that industry in that country can depend on how easy it is for them to get a same level role or a better role, right? As opposed to, like you just said, where sometimes you have to take something a bit more junior because you're in a position where regardless of my career, I still need to put food on the table. Um, when <laughs> That's something that, again, a cover letter actually could benefit you for because you can actually call out objections in a cover letter and explain why someone who's a senior as yourself is applying for this type of role. However, again, assessing the value of your specific industry, the industry that the job you're, you're looking to get is valued in, uh, in the country that you are now moving to. If it's a high value industry and the people in that industry are, are highly sought after, it could be worth maybe not going for that junior role. I know people who, believe me, this year has been a bit funny and typically their role would be in high demand, right? But instead of taking a junior role uh, that would reflect on their CV where they worked here, they take like a like a smaller, you know, like a part-time job even just to keep the lights on on the side where it gives them opportunity to still apply for an opportunity that's in line with their career, makes them a little bit of money on the side. And that's just something that they won't mention on their resume, right? They're not going to necessarily mention they were bartending in evenings, right, for mm -hmm. five months while I was waiting to become a product owner, as an example. But they had to do what they had to do to make it work. And by holding out for a time when the market was a little bit better, they ended up finally landing that opportunity, right? So there's no, like, clear answer as to, as to how to go about doing it. It's very individual. It's very dependent on uh, the industry within the market that you're going to what you were doing before, it's tricky. I'm sorry, I don't have a, a clear, you know, one size fits all answer yeah. for you there. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's a, I know it's a difficult question. And there is another popular question. So if we get a recommendation mm -hmm. um, uh, from, from someone within the company that we are applying, is that good? Is really valuable? Um, yeah, sometimes that's an automatic interview. At a lot of companies, if somebody internally refers you, it might take a little bit of time. It may not happen tomorrow, but referrals are always gone to first. So if I work at Montreal Associates and you want to work there and I know you really well and I think you'd be great, directly I refer you for the role, it's like you're getting an interview, right? It's, it's that easy sometimes. The only reason I think you wouldn't get an interview is if something changes within the organization and the position closes, nobody knows about it, and there's just a bit disorganized maybe internally. Otherwise, if the position is valid, it's still open, they don't have a candidate and you get referred, you can expect an interview for sure. So leverage that. If you have a network of people who want to help you, people who can refer you, that's like numero uno. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you. So, well, we have um, uh, more questions, but yeah, uh, we, are, no, we are running out of time. So we will um, ask you two more because uh, we want to have a photo group and you guys will receive the poll and you need to say yes to the photo group before, be, before taking it. So the last two questions, um, how do you know about the hidden job market or the positions that are not published on LinkedIn? Uh, so that's 100% networking. So when you look at the hidden job market, Normally, like when you look at a, what we would call one of our clients, so I work at a recruiting agency, right? We have clients, they come to us and they ask us for to find them people. The companies that ask us sometimes will have like a very standard process to try and, and make things fair where they have to post a job for two weeks. They look at, you know, all of the applicants and then they make a decision. If they can't find anyone, then they can go to like an alternate source, right? I'm not... You know, sometimes it's very possible that these, I'm not saying all of them do it, but I, I know for a fact some of them have done it where they already have a candidate in mind that they want to hire, 
right? But they have to post it for two weeks just to let the posting expire to say, oh, we didn't find a suitable candidate. We happen to have one from our network. We want to hire this person and that person gets hired. Everyone else who applied has no idea what happened. But that's an example of like the hidden job market where from someone's network directly internally with a company hiring, they had the job, I don't want to say locked down, but they definitely had a pretty good head start where everyone else who applied effectively is for nothing. Now, I'm not trying to discourage you in saying everyone does this, right? But at times it can happen and that's an example of it. For us at a recruitment agency, right? I've recruited on the permanent side, so permanent recruitment, permanent jobs, and now I recruit mainly contractors, right? From a permanent perspective, part of my job is simply just like understanding who's on the market, who's really good, all that good stuff. I get a job from my client who doesn't want to post this online anymore. Maybe they posted it for two weeks as an example. They pulled it down. We're going to send this out to agencies. I'm not going to post this online if I can avoid it and have people apply. I'm going to go to people that I know are really good and I'm going to call them and I'm going to say, hey, this is why, you know, opportunity that I have for you. You know, we know each other really well. What do you think? This is what it pays, all that good stuff. You want to have a chat about it. And we have a chat about it. I may submit one person for that role. The only person that hiring manager sees for the job is this one person, All right? So that's another example of a, of a hidden job market where I'm not posting it. It's not uh, open, right? Even with contract, especially with contract opportunities, we try and never post them. So there are people who've worked for us or people who've been referred to us that we know and we trust. We're always going to go to that pool of talent first. They're going to get the call. They get first refusal because we know them. We, we, we've worked with them before, right? But little by little, they start to refer someone else that we haven't worked with, but they speak highly of them. Okay, now we're going to call this person that time, right? So as an example of a hidden job market, and the only way to get in on that is to network, right? Yeah. You've got to know more people, and more people have to know what you bring to the table and why you're really good at what you do. Then people will just call you. That's an example of, of, of that, exactly. Thank you. Well, the last question before passing to our photo group, does LinkedIn Premium really help on job searching? So, I mean, I, I've had pretty much my whole career, I've had a premium account because most agency recruiters will. So it's hard for me to compare uh, my own experience. My brother actually uh, swears by it. So he he works as an animator. He's uh makes cartoons <laughs> in short. And when he was, was coming up, he started, he had no experience. He was self-taught and he bought LinkedIn premium. Like this must've been 2016, I guess. No. Yeah. Probably about 2016, right. Is about when he finished school and he told me, he's like, man, I, I can't believe the value in this. Like I'm able to connect with more people, message more people. I couldn't verbatim tell you like all the benefits of it, but from his perspective, Apparently, it helped him a lot in landing his first gig. It was actually ended up being with, with Snapchat. It's the first place that he worked. Um, so, yeah, in short, it could be worth it. It could be worth giving it a try. I don't know what the prices are now compared to what they used to be and what they offered back then and what they offer now. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know the complete difference, but I think it's worth exploring if you have a bit of cash and, and the numbers make sense. Give it a try for a month, see the value, two months, one quarter. If you like it, keep going. And if not, um, Else. <laughs> Thank you. And when just a petition for you, is it possible for you to read the other questions and answer them and send yeah. us the, your answers back? Yeah, of course. Oh, I, perfect. I don't want to <laughs> lose them. Is there, I got to see this chat. Where did we cut off? Mm -mm. Can I can I post to this chat uh, when it closes or no? Will I be? Oh, uh, we we will send you the the comments and the questions. Oh, nice. and then you Perfect. and you you can answer it and get them 100%. back to us. Mm -hmm. Hundred percent, I can do okay. that. Okay, absolutely. Yeah, perfect. Because there are like probably six or more questions, but we are it's uh, now seven o six, and uh, so we have our poll first and our photo group. Thank you. Thank you, Mauricio, for no, thank this, you. this is great. Uh, outstanding presentation, a lot of information, very useful Hope tips. It helps. Hope it helps. <laughs> Definitely. And um, th for sure, uh, our T Hispanotech members, they will get in contact with you through LinkedIn. Please, please, thank it would you. be great.